Hi, everyone. This is Dr. JC Vargas um, under Vargas Academy. I am recording this video for students who will need help with musculoskeletal disorders. Uh, this includes nurses, APRNs, new graduates um, who could use um, clinical guidance in diagnosing, treating, identifying signs and symptoms, and able to refer patients to the specialist. So before uh, we proceed to the diseases, I would like to introduce some basics, um, especially the terms and the um, meaning of common uh, clinical symptoms or diagnosis even that we um, see in the clinical setting. So tear is, um, is common, uh, meniscal tear, rotator cuff tear are examples. Um, it means uh, pull apart by force, a third degree tear sprain or um, a strain. And then it can happen in soft tissues, which is muscles, tendons, and ligaments. And then we have strain, lumbar strain, um, knee strain, wrist strain are examples, occurs with twisting, pulling, or a tear in the muscle or tendon. Then we have sprain, which means a stretched or torn ligament. Malunion is when the bones are fractured, looks like bent. Fractured bones looks bented, and it heals in abnormal position if that happens, um, and it also leads to impaired bone function. Fracture, partial or complete break in the bone, and then we have contusion. Um, contusion means bruises of the bones and usually injured at the microscopic level, and it's less severe than a fracture. So um, a tear is often seen um, on exams and also sprain is very common. A sprain is defined as an injury to the ligaments that connects bone to bone in a joint that results from a twisting motion and also can cause joint instability. So that is a sprain, S-P-R-A-I-N. Um, a strain in definition is defined as an injury to the muscles and also the tendons that attach a muscle to the bone. So know these two differences um, uh, in terms. And then we have basic factors to consider. Um, posture is often very important um, when you diagnose or differentiate between sprain and strain. Um, these patients will have um, discomfort and fatigue that makes them change their posture. For example, lumbar strain or lumbar uh, stenosis, uh, degeneration of lumbar uh, spine, right? So they will sit, um, try to adjust to their position, um, and they have a leaning forward position. Sometimes they cannot bend backward. Um, also, the position of the arm in case of carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, or a wrist strain or fracture. So posture is an important term to remember. Um, and repetitive movement is another one um, that often we uh, document on carpal tunnel syndrome or um, mechanics who has knee pain, knee strains. These are clinical examples that you will see. And then vibration. Vibration is also um, can occur when there is a strain and strain related discomfort and fatigue. Um, uh, so you want to document these clinical terms or the medical language for a better reimbursement for insurance purposes also. All of these conditions, basically, we educate our patients, um, you know, if it's related to a postural um, technique that they're not using it comfortably, educate them on postures, take short breaks. I'm just saying that for examples, or um, if patients with repetitive motion of typing, um, computer programmers tell them to wear a brace for positioning of that wrist if they have carpal tunnel syndrome. And then musculoskeletal disorders is MSDs. Um, there's basic classification, inflammatory joint diseases, skeletal muscle tumors, soft tissue musculoskeletal injuries, and there are various type of fractures. So rotator cuff disorder is the first one I like to discuss because I see this a lot in my clinical setting. The most common cause of this is shoulder pain secondary to a micro tra trauma or repetitive stress, usually with the uh, you know workers who are in in, in grocery stores, like heavy lifting, um, they uh, like uh, people who store uh, groceries and products in the in the in the shelves, or mechanics who have to lift heavy equipment. 
um, the, uh, there are, you know, in even in nursing, you know, we have to move patients. So, you know, workman comes cases, we always see rotator cuff related injuries, um, athletes and older adults is the other categories. Imaging is done with ultrasound of the um, affected shoulder. You always want to look at low cost diagnostic imaging and to confirm the rotator cuff tear and biceps or labral, you may always do an MRI. The pathophysiology behind the rotator cuff disorder is repetition of movement caused micro trauma in the rotator cuff tendon fibers that leads to partial tear of the tendon, which can eventually progress to a full tear. And um, sometimes this is often diagnosed as tendonitis or bursitis, as you see on those medical records. Um, we always refer them to physical therapy first. Um, pain is a, a concern that needs to be addressed. Um, NSAIDs, if they can tolerate with no GI side effects, always tell them to eat something before they take NSAIDs and also cryotherapy. Adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder. Um, once in a while, you see these um, in uh, exams. Also in the clinical settings, um, I have several cases, especially in middle-aged adults. Um, usually they complain of unilateral nocturnal shoulder pain. They will have severe pain with range of motion and um, their activities are very limited because even with active and passive range of motion, they have uh, pain. Um, most common with abduction and at external rotation cases, um, range of motion. Pathophysiology on adhesive capsulitis is a combination of inflammation of the synovial membrane and also the joint capsule is inflamed. Eventually, it causes capsular fibrosis and scarring. And uh, another term they use for this is arthrofibrosis. So know these terms. As the capsule folds become scarred and tightened, the shoulder movement becomes restricted and joint pain occurs. Diagnosed with um, MR arthrography, and then you treat with shoulder injections. Um, steroids are used, intraarticular um, dilations with um, uh, patients who have failed NSAID therapy. Arthritis is a very general um, term for multi joint inflammation. Um, so there are several types of arthritis, but the thing is most common signs and symptoms of all of these are pain at the affected joint, stiffness, sometimes swelling, sometimes redness, and of course they all have limited range of motion. So the examples are given here, the ones that we are going to discuss in this video, gout, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, septic ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, and um, uh, there are juvenile idiopathic arthritis. I have a link that attached to this. Um, so Google that and research and read on um, the different types um, and examples and medications used. The ones that I have discussed here is the one um, that you will see in the clinical settings and like I said, on exams. Septic arthritis, um, it is a life-threatening case and um, you, you will see a lot of swelling and edema at the um, site where the um, patient complains of pain or as, you, know, you suspect sepsis. And there is capsular distension and there is displaced articular structures and that indicates there is effusion in that joint. The risk factors we see are um, prosthesis, um, infection with HIV, and older adults over 80 years, and IV drug users, and especially comorbidities like diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis. Pathophysiology depends on the infective organism. Um, it multiplies in the synovial fluid and the synovial lining. The most common bacteria is Staphylococcus aureus, very important. Bacterial infection by strep, staph, pneumococcus, gonococcus, and meningococcus are the ones that we see when we do the culture. Patients will have sudden onset of severe joint pain with poor range of motion, fever, and malaise. Synovial fluid is aspirated, and we send it for culture and sensitivity. Gout, um, you know, think uric acid when you have gout-related arthritis. Usually very common in patients who are about 40 years old. Um, there is monosodium 
urate crystals, uh, which is also called as uric acid crystals. That is the causative agent of acute inflammatory gout. These patients will also have hyperuricemia and this uh, it's seen under the skin, especially in the distal phalangeal joints, mostly affecting in the hand joint, but um, you will see it on the uh, great toe clinically and wrist and base of the thumb is also affected. The diagnosis is confirmed based on fluid aspiration from joint and then clinical signs and symptoms. Pathophysiology is the MSU, monosodium urate crystals, innate, who, um, activate innate host defense mechanism and macrophages in the tissues, and they collect neutrophils that triggers the robust inflammation from immune activation. The formation of TOFI deposits are seen in soft tissues and urate crystals is seen in the joints, um, especially the synovial joints, and then mostly affects the gray toe than any other joint, like I said. There's an article that I have um, attached here in the slide, so that gives you a further detail, like three, four pages of the further studies that was done on multiple patients with the different comorbidities. It's a great article for you to review. Osteoarthritis, it's um, very common. You will see this a lot in the clinical setting. Um, osteoarthritis, uh, you know, patients will have uh, pain in the knees, hips, hands, usually from overuse. Overuse is the key word here. It can be primary and secondary, okay? There's two kinds. Pathophysiology, you have to know that there is degeneration that involves the whole joint, and also there is cartilage degradation. This is the key word here. Those who are taking patho courses, the degeneration involving the whole joint with cartilage degradation is the key word here. There is bone remodeling, osteophyte formation, synovial inflammation. All of these process leads to pain, stiffness, swelling, and the normal loss of range of motion. Signs and symptoms of osteoarthritis, early morning stiffness, very important. And there is bony enlargement. I've seen in my long-term care um, clinical setting that a lot of our elderly clients have these lymph, you know, looks like lymph nodes on their hands, but um, on the dip, uh, uh, the MIP and the dip, those bones, they will have uh, Bouchard or Heberden's nodes, okay? So when you touch their knuckles, you feel that, especially on, on the hands, and then these are usually asymmetrical joints are affected. They also have severe uh, deformity and decreased range of motion with instability at that particular joint. This is confirmed with x-rays and of course, physical exam. There is loss of joint space, bone damage, and bone remodeling occurs with the bone spurs. So keep in mind as clinicians or nurse practitioners and nurses, our goal is to improve their function and also their uh, pain reduction, okay? So the first thing you wanna consider is lifestyle modification. Consider uh, addressing weight loss if they are overweight or obese, and then um, encourage them to exercise, give them analgesics if they can tolerate insects, give them that as an anti-inflammatory, and which actually blocks the enzymes that causes the pain and swelling. Examples are Motrin or Advil, and we also give Naprosen. Keep in mind, there should not be any GI risk factors when you prescribe them. Walterin. Walterin comes in gel and also in tablets. Um, you can use that for supportive therapy. Worst scenarios, I have seen patients taking tramadol and then intra-articular steroid injections and topical capsaicin, an excellent choice, okay? There is an article to review on the bottom of the slide. Um, it gives you more clinical um, examples and scenarios. Um, feel, you know, make sure you read that for additional Osteomyelitis, I've seen this on exams. Um, infection of the bone, most common bacterial cause is Staph aureus. There's two types, exogenous and hematogenous. And look at the signs and symptoms, diagnosed with MRI and culture with bone biopsies and debridement, which is the gold standard. And then um, be treated with biopsies, culture, and then use the antibiotic based on the sensitivity. Beta-lactams and vancomycins are given as initial treatment. If not tolerable, they can take napsilin and cipro based on their culture and sensitivity. If there is an open wound, refer them to wound uh, clinic for surgical debridement.
Osteopenia and osteoporosis, very important for clinical nurses. It's a common bone disease um, developed during remodeling cycle due to low mineral density. So characterized by low bone mass, deterioration of bone tissue, disruption of bone microarchitecture. This leads to compromised strengthening of the bone and also increases the risk for fractures. There are two types, primary and secondary, though there are modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors that everybody should know. This is the this is where we can teach patients based on the characteristics and the risk factors. The modifiable risk factors are smoking, high caffeine intake, high alcohol intake, sedentary lifestyle, patients who have calcium deficiency and estrogen deficiency. You know, women trend, tend to lose up one third of their original bone mass over time. Um, you know, that is ultimately affecting 80% of their skeletal system. So it is essential that modifiable risk factors be modified because there are many factors that cannot, including their age, um, um, which is old age, increasing age, and their race, which is common in Caucasian women, their gender, their pale complexion, and sometimes they use long-term corticosteroid therapy. So know the modifiable risk factors of osteoporosis is very important. Back to two types, the primary osteoporosis and secondary. Know the difference between them and the clinical examples. A lot of my students in the previous classes have missed the word hyperparathyroidism causing secondary osteoporosis. So I have added all the clinical examples from the books, from the articles, and also from my clinical experience. So it's very important, okay? Pay attention to each of those and memorize it because you don't wanna miss that. It's a simple mistakes, hormone imbalance, diabetes, hyperparathyroidism, hyperthyroidism, medications such as steroids, phenytoin, barbiturates, lithium, and heparin, use of tobacco and ethanol. So knowing this, you can identify the modifiable risk factors and non-modifiable risk factors. Bone de and dexa, scan, the de dexa scan. Women, it's recommended for women age 65 and older, men or 70 and older, adults with a fragility fracture, and um, the guidelines are listed under the U.S. Preventative Service Tax for, Task Force ORG website. Um, so review that. Uh, the recommendation for both men and women is listed there. Um, it's very important. So this is kind of like a reminder slide to get comfortable with that uh, website. Understanding bone density scan. A lot of my students do not understand how to read and interpret the DEXA scan. The most common um, the DEXA scan related question is on osteoporosis. So number three, memorize it. A T-score between minus 2.5 or below is osteoporosis. Between minus 1.0 and minus 2.5 indicates low bone density, and that is osteopenia. This is the WHO's classification, so you have to know this. Here's another explanation of both of them based on the WHO, read through it. Here's an article where I obtained this from. Um, it's very important for APRNs. Let's look at osteopenia, characterized by loss of bone mass and low bone min uh, mineral density. It progresses to microstructure architecture of disruption of the bone leading to Decrease to bone strength and increased risk for fracture. Osteopenia progresses to osteoporosis, okay? Lifestyle changes, modification of factors like smoking, regular exercise is important, optimizing nutrition is important. This article is uh, very helpful for overview of management of osteoporosis, so I have attached that. It is not too old, it's from 2017. Treatment options for both OP, um, osteopenia and osteoporosis, lifestyle, vitamin D deficiency, replace that. Um, Anti-resorptive, this is a resorption mechanism damage, right? And that the pathophysiology of the resorption of the osteoclast is what causes this. So anti-resorptive drugs, which increases the BMD by two to 10%. So estrogen replacement, if required, selective estrogen receptor modulators or CERMs, like the 
raloxifene is used. In male androgen replacement therapy, those who have low testosterone and calcitonin, it comes intranasal and injectable form. So use that if required. Um, biphosphonates, alendronate, risidronate, abandonate, and solidronic acid. So this is very common. Solidronic acid, I have seen it on board the same exact word. So know the functions, the side effects, and the risk factors, and the contraindications of biphosphonates. Um, anabolic drugs is another term that the students often don't understand. Um, so the examples are given, anabolic drugs, a parathyroid hormone is one of them. Um, continuous excretion of parathyroid hormone in primary uh, hyperparathyroidism causes bone catabolism, um, characterized by bone loss, right? Exogenously, if you administer the intermittent PTH, parathyroid hormone, it leads to excessive PTH. Um, in three hours, and that becomes anabolic due to stimulation of the osteoclastic bone formation and skeletal remodeling activity increased. The, 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 these terms you have to know, okay? I mean, of course, no patient is going to come and ask you, but there are some educated, knowledgeable patients who are going to ask you, how does this medicine work in my bone? So here we go. You can explain all of that. Daily administration of 20 um, of PTH a fragment increased BMD by 9.7, according to some of the human studies. And the article I listed this is below. Um, and then they use denosumab, which is a recombinant humanized monoclonal antibody against rankle pathway. Rankle pathway suppresses the bone um, reabsorption. So remember, we talked about the resorption um, and osteoclastic activity. So this, um, uh, this particular drug is a specific recombinant humanized monoclonal antibody. It works against that rankal pathway, suppressing the bone resorption. Strontium is indicated in patients who are postmenopausal and they also have osteoporosis. So that's another drug that comes on exams and the students are not familiar with that. Okay, and then moving on to uh, arthritis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and um, psoriasis-related arthritis, psoriatic arthritis. Rheumatoid, keep in mind, it's an autoimmune and inflammatory disease, and um, I want the students to remember the genetic component HLA1-DR1 and HLA-DR4 the two genetic factors that um, uh, causes the pathological mechanisms in rheumatoid arthritis patients, in addition to hormones and environmental factors. There are four stages, read through it, diagnosed with MRIs and the lab work we used is listed there. The, di uh, the treatment is done um, through uh, DMARD, the, you know the examples of DMARD drugs, and then, um, uh, you know, Remember, we talked about uh, osteoporosis with anabolic drugs, the term anabolic versus now we have biologics, okay? Anabolics and biologics. Biologics are examples that are listed here. Um, some of the examples will be just like that or the trade names are used um, in clinical um, settings. So all of these treatments are recommended based on the uh, patients with moderate to high disease activities. Um, DMARD monotherapy with methotrexate is recommended over other medications like hydroxychloroquine or sulfasalicine for patients with moderate to high disease activities. And the guidelines are listed in the article that I have attached to this clinical setting. And um, methotrexate, um, glucocorticoid uh, steroids is another one that they use uh, based on, um, you know, if, the, if there is low disease activity and they don't need a high doses of, you know, methotrexate um, because of the side effects and stuff. So we'd recommend just start with the low dose of steroid and see how the pain is controlled. Um, I know switching from one drug to another, primary care physicians usually don't do that. We refer them to our specialist with rheumatoid, rheumatologist, or even an orthopedist, they can manage that. Primary care, you be initiate all these tests and workup and confirm the diagnosis. 
I've done that in the prim primary care uh, setting. And also, um, you know, if there is you know, side effects and complications, we are not monitoring them, so we refer them to the specialist. Psoriatic arthritis, uh, patients will have a history of psoriasis, and then they, the, the pattern of the arthritis pain is a symmetrical polyarthritis pattern, a common in women, and signs and symptoms, in, most of them, like I said in the beginning, joint pain, swelling, stiffness. Um, the key word here is uh, sausage fingers or toe dactylitis, that's the key word. Sometimes they have back pain radiating to neck and hips. Um, my patients often have heel pain, especially in the achilles tendon areas. And then the nails become pin prick holes and they looks like onycholysis, like nails will, there's a nail changes you can see at the nail plate to finger joint area. The treatment is biologics here, antibiotics that soaks inflammatory molecules helps both skin and joints. Um, know those examples that I listed. And again, DMARTs and NSAIDs are other options. Lyme disease. Um, you will see these on occasionally on exams. It's an infection and know the bacteria that causes it. Pathophysiology and signs and symptoms are uh, you know, described in both stages one, two, three. Um, know the signs and symptoms of stage three, very common on exams. Um, central nervous systems of neuropathy and cephalopathy is seen at stage three. Bell's palsy is often, they use it on exams, um, stage two. Um, if it affects the heart, it is uh, Lyme carditis, especially seen in the EKG with AV block. And then um, cranial nerves, Bell's palsy is one. I found this in an article, um, uh, the mnemonic for uh, Lyme disease signs and symptoms is bake a key Lyme pie. Bell's palsy, arthritis, cardiac with the K, cardiac block, and erythema migrants. So it starts with the red dot, and then it started big, getting bigger and bigger, like a round um, circle. So you can identify it is from the time the tick bite the skin, uh, the area, and then it goes, the redness, erythema becomes bigger and bigger. Clinical signs and symptoms will help you identify that. I have done, um, I have seen these in October, um, usually in that time in my primary care clinic experience. Uh, patients who travel will come back with these uh, rashes. Um, and then confirmation is with the erythema migrants itself. If not, ELISA test, Western blot, cardiac block are done. Treatment is usually amoxicillin or doxycycline, which is very commonly given. Uh, prevention is within two, 72 hours of the tick bite, give the doxycycline. I've seen sarcopenia on exam, so I have added that slide here. It's an age-related muscle loss, uh, multi-system disease, progress over time. It puts patients at a catabolic crisis where they tend to fall due to balance issues. When they fall, they are high-risk for fractures. They have mobility issues and cardiac and respiratory and cognitive symptoms. CT scan and MRIs are the gold standard to diagnose this. Um, it says gold standard, it's gold standard. Ultrasound and DEXA scan is also used. Usually lifestyle modification with encouraging exercise, treat with hormones and drugs that we described earlier, and then high protein diet and vitamin supplement. There are two articles that will benefit a student who is ready for exams. Do those quizlet.com. Um, questions are there so you can practice on sarcopenia because it's not very common. Um, so you wanna make sure you're comfortable with that. Chronic back pain and ankylosing spondylitis. You'll see this on the clinical setting and also on areas where you are specialized with the pain management. So, so back pain, you know, patient comes with lower back pain and they have decreased sensation is what I often see, especially in the lateral leg, web of the great toe. You know, those indicates a dermatomal pattern of discogenic disease. You know, our lumbar spine has L1 through L5, S1 and S2. So these dermatomes are affected in that disc narrowing or degeneration that causes the sensory functions of those uh, alteration. And usually patients will say, I have pain that is coming from the lower buttocks radiating to the still thigh. 
and also to medial calf all the way to the arch of the foot. So um, you want to identify which nerve. Sometimes they have herniation on the MRIs. So there are several causes of back pain. So as clinicians, uh, nurse practitioners, you want to rule out what's causing what, right, based on the symptom. If there is a herniated lumbar intervertebral disc issue, the common cause you wanted to think is corda equina syndrome. So it's very important because this is very da dangerous. Patients will have imbalance incontinence of urine and also bowel and bladder. It's a, it's a true emergency. So don't take that. Corda equina syndrome is one thing that spinal stenosis patients, you want to you want to document that, that you did ask the patient about that particular signs and symptoms. Um, and then, um, you know, signs, based on the pathology um, or the area affected, like hips, knees, sacroiliac area, you want to do those uh, diagnostic tests. Based on your know, pathophysiology in general is there is a variation of human leukocyte antigen B gene, HLA-B, when mutated, produce a protein called HLA-B27. This is what increases the spondylitis, ankylosing spondylitis risk. Okay, I highlighted that with the bolded letters so you will know the difference. The AS is ankylosing spondylitis. So know that the patients are confirmed diagnosis by doing the lab for HLA-B27. Treatment is exercise, NSAIDs, and DMARD steroids and surgery. Fibromyalgia. You'll see a lot of questions on fibromyalgia and a lot of my students are clueless. So I have added that here. So to diagnose fibromyalgia, there has to have, there must be tenderness on digital palpation in at least 11 of 18, which is nine pairs tender point, okay? This is the keyword here. So I have added here so students will remember this. That's how we diagnose. 11 out of 18, which is nine pairs tender point size, including starting from the head, okay? Occiput, low cervical, trapezius, supraspinatus, second rib, lateral epicondyle, gluteal, greater trochanter, and the knee. So, uh, you know, they may have symptoms in the um, uh, PIP, MCP, and MTP joint. They may have tenderness, but think when they have MCP, MTP, and PIP joint tenderness, you want to think rheumatoid arthritis, okay? Um, don't confuse that with uh, fibromyalgia because fibromyalgia is a multi-joint um, inflammation, right? So students often get confused with that. Another thing is uh, managing fibromyalgia. Am Amitriptyline or Elevil or duloxetine is given early stages because it helps them with their sleep. It helps with the uh, depression and anxiety. These patients are already fatigued and they have stiff joints and pains. They probably are already doing physical therapy and including exercise. So it's an important factor to make sure that they continue that. Sometimes we can inject a trigger points with local anesthetics. I have done that on my pain management clinic. Uh, we don't use steroids much unless they have swelling and inflammation in the knee joints and shoulders. But trigger point injections is where the point of tenderness you inject with uh, normal saline or lidocaine in your worst uh, scenario. So fibromyalgia, pay attention to um, the key points the patient's um, explain to you where is the point of tenderness, is it related to um, you know, fatigue and myalgia, so like a regular myalgia from skin infections um, or any insect bites, you know, maybe a viral fever. Okay. And then we have carpal tunnel syndrome. It's also called nerve entrapment syndrome caused by compression of median nerve. Um, there is an uh, indication of repetitive stress, typing and mechanical work, manual labor employees. They have these repetition of movement in their hand. And uh, patients complains of pinsanidal sensation, which is called the paresthesias. They are unable to hold objects, doorknobs, hammer and nail, lift a gallon of milk. Those are the examples my patients give. Diagnosed with electrophysiology. In the clinical settings, we can do a phalanx test, ask them to flex the wrist as far as possible for one minute. 
We also do Tinel's test, which is tapping up the median nerve. And now they also have uh, Durkan sign. Durkan sign is manually compressing the thumb towards the transverse carpal ligament for 30 seconds, and that elicits pain. It is, um, there is a nice uh, video on YouTube that I reviewed for CTS. It's a given for medical students, um, kind of level with pictures and stuff. So if you need additional review, uh, that's a great way. And here's an attachment of the site. Um, these are examples of pediatric musculoskeletal disorders. I am not explaining that in this video um, because it's a long one. And also, um, I've seen questions on Page's disease, rickets, and scoliosis and kyphosis. Um, I will have to do another video on pediatric musculoskeletal disorders. For those who are taking um, FNPs and exams, make sure you are comfortable with these pediatric musculoskeletal disorders. And here's all the um, reviews that I made um, from uh, these, uh, these uh, supportive articles and um, journals. You are welcome to use that. Um, and I, uh, you know, I always, uh, you know, guidelines changes all the time. So I always look out to see if there is anything new when I make these videos based in addition to my clinical experience over 30 years. And I've been an NP for over 15, 17 years and now uh, teaching online over 20 years. So things changes all the time. So I always look at extra uh, resources to give you the best information. Another thing that I have seen students um, uh, overconfidence and make mistakes is bursitis. Bursitis is inflammation that uh, can be caused by infection, trauma, or repetition of movement. Uh, they may have an underlying gout or even cancer. So um, something that's related to uh, inflammation and infection, just make sure you identify. Usually I've seen this on the elbows. Um, bursitis is very common. Hip, hip joint is another joint. Um, and another thing is tennis elbow. With tennis elbow, wrist and finger extension, it causes pain over the extensor carpi radialis brevis tendon. It's a long word, but it's important for clinicians to know this, okay? Tennis elbow, think the extensor carpi radialis brevis tendon. The extensor carpi radialis longus tendon. And also they have digitorus communis. So there's, so there's three tendons that is connected to the wrist that causes tennis elbow. So um, read through that, make sure you understand, um, identify this so that you can, um, you know, uh, distinguish that tennis elbow with carpal tunnel syndrome, okay? And then um, uh, from uh, test reviews and exam reviews, I had, um, you know, students who has made mistakes on um, genetic disorders. Uh, one of them is deputrans contracture. Um, it's, you know, there is nodular genetic disorder in new Northern European descent people, okay? Nodular descent, um, nodular genetic disorder of people in Northern European descent. Um, Deputrans contracture is, you will see this on, um, in the clinical setting. Uh, sometimes you may see it under the medical history. It is a nodular thickening of the palmar fascia that draws the finger inward to the palm. Like they are asking, you ask them to make a fist. So you're bringing the palm, um, palmar fascia that draws to the fingers inward to the palm, they will have pain. So they have contractures there, uh, yet surgically corrected. Uh, try not to give Advil to every single uh, ortho conditions, rule out what's causing it uh, because you, you may miss a major diagnosis. Um, in the pediatrics, dysplasia of the hip is important, especially congenital hip dislocation cases. Um, questions are on, on DDH, like developmental dysplasia of the hip. I've seen questions in the past before when I do the exam reviews. Um, know all these tests, you know, Tinel, Tinel Phelan, Allen test, um, you know, Allen, um, Allen test is used for um, radial and ulnar arteries. Uh, they use that to uh, check the patency. 
uh, or know all these, uh, you know, stimulation test or um, carpal tunnel stimulation test. Um, and uh, make sure you know the national, um, you know, recommendation, uh, management of arthritis, management of fibromyalgia. Um, how do you differentiate uh, uh, fibromyalgia with the chronic fatigue syndrome? You know, these, these are the things that commonly the students miss. So that concludes uh, this video. If you have any questions, uh, if you need a copy of these slides, let me know. Vargas Academy 2023 at gmail.com. The Lord bless you and keep you. Have a blessed day.